will present a workshop about kernel methods for quantum machine learning. Uh, the goal of this workshop is to try to understand the state of the art of kernel methods uh, in the field of quantum machine learning and to be aware of the challenges and the possibilities that uh, these kind of methods um, uh, give us today in the um, in this kind of algorithms. So, okay, let's just start by a short review of the contents of the talk. We will introduce uh, the support vector machine, the classical, the very famous classical algorithm for binary classification. We will like uh, explain it very briefly in order to set uh, the, the notation and in order to all of us be in the same page. We will uh, then explain the kernel trick, very famous kernel trick, uh, which allows to perform nonlinear classification. And then we will uh, smoothly introduce the role of quantum in all of these kind of algorithms and try to understand where, where we can introduce some quantum part in, in the algorithms. We will talk about data encoding and how it is related with the quantum support vector machine. And in special, we will focus on data reloading and we will try to motivate why this is so important. And finally, we will uh, comment some interesting papers and some state of the art papers, uh, which are some papers that I consider that are crucial uh, in this in this field. So let's start by reviewing the support machine. The task is commonly known is to classify a vector into one of two classes. Let's call this uh, A and B. Uh, this classes has a label assigned, which can be plus one or minus one. And how do we do that? We find the maximum margin hyperplane. So we consider some two kind, uh, two different kind of points. For example, we could separate these points with plane or with this plane. But the goal is to try to find the plane which maximizes the separation between these two clusters of points. So this, in this case, this would be the, the maximal uh, margin uh, hyperplane. Hyper so one side of the plane, we have uh, one class and the other side, we have the other class. And here, what, what we find is the, uh, this is maximized, the margin is maximized. And here, the points that lies on the margin are the, support vectors. So this traduced to a convex quadratic op optimization problem. This is the, the form of, of, the, uh, of this problem. And this is, and how, uh, as this is a convex quadratic uh, problem, this can be solved. And we know that this uh, has uh, one solution that can be, that can be found uh, classically. And this is the form of the Lagrangian that we need to maximize in order to find these alpha parameters, which are uh, Lagrange, uh, Lagrange multipliers, and which can, uh, once we find these uh, alpha parameters, we are able to construct this hyperplane. Here we will uh, talk about this uh, K, which is actually a matrix later, but uh, in order to have this compact form uh, of this expression, we have just shift this uh, this metric, which is actually the ground metric, as is going to be introduced now. Notice that all these Lagrange multipliers uh, need to be um, uh, positive or, or equal to zero. So, okay, once we have found these alpha parameters by quadratic programming, the hyperplane is defined and we are able to classify a given uh, test point, okay? So uh, we set the model with the training points, computing these uh, alpha parameters, hyperplane defined, we are able to classify new points, which uh, we don't know they belong to. So, okay, the prediction is performed this way. So now notice uh, I remarked that we have found these parameters. We know the labels as, as this is a supervised, uh, quantum, uh, supervised machine learning algorithm. We know the labels of the training points. This I is running from all the training points in the data set, uh, we have capital M training points. And here we are computing this quantity between uh, all the training points and the test point that we want to classify. So we are somehow waiting uh, the, 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 the training points with the test point. And the sign will give us the, the class uh, that we assign to this new point. So, OK. Uh, this is important. All the uh, Lagrange multipliers, we have 
the number of Lagrange multipliers equal to the number of training points. However, uh, most of them are equal to zero. Are and the only uh, Lagrange multipliers that are not equal to zero are this those one associated with support vectors. Okay, so only the support vectors are playing a role in the classification. M is the number of training points. Each one of these training points. Uh, can have uh, n capital N futures. This can these points can live in a higher in a very high dimensional uh, space, and this is the famous grand matrix. So, this is a matrix. Uh, in in the case that we are uh, dealing with a linearly separable problem, uh, this is just the inner product between uh, training points. Okay, so. Uh, we need to evaluate this number of dot products. Uh, each one is taken of the order of, of, of n, as the uh, points are n-dimensional. And we need to find the, the optimal uh, alpha coefficients, which uh, this process takes m squared. So globally, this uh, support vector machine algorithm, if we want an accuracy epsilon, this is the complexity of this classical uh, support vector machine algorithm to perform classification. OK, so what happens when we are dealing with uh, non-linear models? We use the kernel trick. For example, this is a very famous, uh, the, the square problem is the very famous, a very famous example to understand what is the, the kernel trick. Here we have this two-dimensional uh, data space where we have these four points. And here we are not able to uh, construct a plane uh, which separates the two classes, uh, a linear plane which separates the two classes of points. So what we do uh, is to find a future map which uh, embeds these uh, input points in a higher dimensional space. For example, we can construct this future map. And this way, now we have three a three-dimensional data space, and we can retrieve the coordinates in this higher dimensional space. For example, these two red points, we can just substitute the, the, the components here and see that this third component is going to be zero. And now these uh, blue points uh, somehow are uh, in, in another plane, uh, taking advantage of this extra, extra dimension. So if we perform an overview of this of this uh, construction here we see that in this higher dimensional space we are able to construct an a linear which uh, is going to separate the two classes of the problem so now the this gram matrix instead of being just the inner product between training points is going to be the inner product between the the transform uh, the transform training points okay so, okay, now let's go for the role of quantum in all this uh, classical algorithm, a very well established classical algorithm for machine learning. So, okay, we know that we got some quantum basic linear algebra subroutines, for example, the quantum phase estimation, the quantum Fourier transform, which actually has shown some speed up over their, their classical counterparts. So the very first approach to to the quantum version or the first quantum version for a support vector machine is, is explained in this paper, Quantum Support Vector Machine for Big Data Classification from Reventros, Mosenia, and Seth Lloyd. And basically what they do is an interesting approach where they reformulate the optimization problem that is performed in, in a support vector machine in order to, to use, uh, they enforce the algorithm to, to to be solved using quantum phase estimation and quantum metrics inversion algorithm, the famous HHL algorithm. So, okay, we know which subroutines are giving us quantum advantage, so we force our problem to be solved with these subroutines. So this is like the, the, the trick here. And uh, theoretically, they find an algorithmic complexity of the, which is logarithmic with the number of, of training points. Uh, remember that uh, beforehand, with, in the classical part, we had this uh, polynomial in the number of training points, and now we have a logarithmic in the number of, of training points. So we have, uh, in theory, an uh, exponential uh, speed up this algorithm. However, not everything is, is so, so easy here, because to, to construct this, uh, the, their proposal, this quantum algorithm, we need, for example, quantum random access memory, which actually we don't, we, 
uh, know that there's no a general way to construct this kind of of memories and in fact uh, they require uh, uh, resor uh, hardware resources to 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 be constructed so okay uh, now uh, in practice uh, for which we can use the quantum computers in in this uh, super vector machine apart from the all the all apart from the algorithm which is presented in this paper so basically and it's gonna be i think it's, it's easy to see uh, we can construct quantum future maps i have shown you that that when a problem is not linearly separable we need to find a future map a sweet future map in order to find a higher dimensional space where we can uh, separate linearly the the points and we can compute the gram matrix okay the gram matrix is just the overlap between these uh, these future uh, vectors after the, the the transformation and in our case or in general for in quantum computers we will compute like the, the square of this of this quantity so starting by this uh, construction of quantum future maps there was this very very relevant paper in this field which is supervised learning with quantum enhanced future spaces which actually uh, presented uh, some uh, generic future maps which are constructed this way where we have here the Pauli matrices and S is connectivity between connectivities between qubits and they show they show explicitly how these ansatz the form of this of these ansatz and from here we obtain the set future map which um, doesn't have entanglement the set set future map which contains entanglement and the Pauli future maps these these are very famous future maps generic future maps in fact if you use Qiskit or if you are uh, used to this to these libraries these future maps are already implemented because are very well known future maps which actually were um, were presented in in this work so okay in order to have quantum advantage, and this is very important, I will come back again to this statement, we need a kernel or a future map which give us a kernel hard to estimate classically. If I have a kernel which is easy to compute, to be compute classically, we will not find any quantum advantage. However, the inverse of this statement is not true. You have quantum kernel to estimate classically, and even with this, maybe you are not able to retrieve any quantum advantage. Okay, so this was the the the, the first work, uh, the very first relevant work with this uh, kernel methods, which actually was showing that this could be implemented uh, hardware hardware efficiently. And in fact, this, for example, this set set future map uh, is claimed that this uh, future map is not. Um, it's not efficient its computation uh, classically so this is why these future maps are uh, so powerful and were so so famous other work very relevant work here is a rigorous and robust quantum speed up in super supervised machine learning and in fact in this paper they are showing some quantum advantage with respect to the, the classical parts uh, they take a classically uh, hard problem which is the discrete logarithm problem and this uh, to, to solve this problem they uh, use the quantum Fourier transform and, and the basic concepts of, of Schorr's algorithm to construct a future map which is uh, very suitable for this problem so what we are do what, what they uh, do is they know where do we have advantage which is in the quantum Fourier transform and they look for a problem which uh, can be solved with this advantage okay this is like the inverse way the ideal was uh, uh, the ideal would be to have a problem and look for the advantage using quantum tools. However, so far the state of the art is that we are still trying to show the advantage in th theoretically and not for uh, real problems. Okay, these are toy models designed in order to show that in some cases we can find some advantage using uh, using quantum. Okay, and uh, what we can do also is to compute the gram matrix uh, into a quantum computer and to do so I will explain the, the two ways that we can do it the first of all the, the first of the of these two ways is to construct these quantum states in general we will start by this uh, all the qubits in the zero state and we will apply some unitary which is encoding this future map 
And then uh, once we have uh, constructed these two quantum states, we will perform swap tests between them. Okay, this is the construction. We have these two registers where we encode uh, these uh, future maps and then we perform the swap test, uh, which requires uh, this uh, complexity to acquire this uh, precision epsilon. In fact, here uh, also we need to use an ancillary qubit, which is not in the picture, but just to see uh, the resources that we need in for this uh, with this method. We also have uh, uh, the possibility to construct this quantum circuit uh, and then uh, compute the probability to obtain this this quantum state. Okay, this uh, is done. Uh, this is done in this way. Okay, so we. First of all, we uh, apply this unitary, which is encoding me one of the training points, and then we apply this unitary dagger, but now with another training point. What we obtain when we measure this register is this uh, a kind of histogram with the probabilities of measuring each one of the of the basic states, and the probability associated with measuring this state is going to be directly the uh, the the element of the gram matrix. Okay, so in terms of depth, the first circuit is better because we uh, we don't need too much gates applied uh, in parallel. But in number of qubits, uh, this is not uh, as good as the second one. The second one is better in the number of qubits as we only need one register and we don't need ancillary qubits. And but in terms of depth, here we have more uh, more layers uh, in the register. Okay, so. Uh, now, I, I want to explain, now that we know uh, quantum computers, where, where we can use quantum computers in these algorithms, I want to show that the when we encode and we, we perform encoding in a quantum circuit, we are somehow constructing a quantum kernel. Each encoding has a quantum kernel associated. Okay, so for example, if we consider the basic encoding, which is just have a bit string and encode it into a uh, its correspondent uh, element of the canonical of the computational basis. What we have is a Kronecker delta kernel. We have the amplitude encoding, which is very famous, is to encode the classical data into the amplitude of, of, of a quantum state. What we have is the linear kernel, which is used to perform linear classification. We have the uh, copies of, of a quantum state, which is encoded with amplitude encoding, we can obtain polynomial kernels. For example, if we have a product encoding, which is just obtained with applying single qubit gates in each qubit, uh, we can obtain a cosine kernel, which is constructed this way. So, okay, we see that we have uh, seen where we can use quantum computers, and we see that when we encode information into a quantum computer, we are uh, implicitly generating a kernel. So once we have seen how uh, how this encoding is related with, with quantum kernels, I want to talk about uh, data reuploading, which uh, in fact this was this technique was presented in this in this paper uh, three years ago. And what they do is they propose uh, using a single qubit to perform uh, to apply a unitary which is encoding uh, some classical classical information point and then subsequently apply a unitary with some tunable parameters this is one layer and they suggest to do it uh, apply this many times so for example we can have a capital l layers in each layer we are encoding again the the, the point okay and in each layer we are Adding, adding extra tunable parameters. So, okay, after that, we, we let's call this quantum state, which is the output of this, uh, this unitary gates, let's call it psi. And then if we measure this, uh, this, we are able to perform a classification. We are able to assign a label to this. So this allows, this repetition of layers allows to introduce non-linearities to our classification model. We know that quantum mechanics are linear, and if we want to uh, introduce non-linearities, this is one way to do it, which is just adding some layers, which are each one of them are encoding again the, the input point. So this whole uh, unitary, this whole circuit is just encoding 
an input point into a future a future vector which also uh, also is depending in some trainable parameters here okay so this is a kind of the analog of a, of a neural network okay which uh, I emphasize that we here we have some tunable parameters and we are uploading the information uh, many times. So they propose a single qubit binary classifier. So if we consider a qubit, they uh, assign to the north pole of the qubit to the zero state, the class one class and the other class to the to the south pole, the one state. And we start by uh, with the qubit and zero, and we perform some rotation in the block sphere, and we end up with this tri state, which is just this one here. And to perform classification, you just need to compute the fidelity of or the distance uh, of this point with respect to the this uh, uh, label state, and you assign the the label uh, just to computing the shorter the, the shortest overlap between okay. This is closer to this state. I assign its its label, so it's it's quite simple. So okay, the idea here is that a very simple decision boundary in Hilbert space, which is just actually the side the shorter distance with respect to two uh, two basic states, can correspond to a highly complex in data space. So let's uh, I want to show you this. So imagine that we want to perform classific uh, binary classification of these kind of points. We have here two classes. And the decision boundary is just the line which is separating me the, the, the two different kind of points. So the decision boundary is just a function, an implicit function of the of the coordinates equated to zero. Okay. So in this in this boundary, I don't know which plan which class I need to assign. So here in this model, it's let's say it's simple to understand which is the decision boundary as we are assigning uh, as we are assigning the class. Uh, to the shorter distance, the decision boundary will lie, uh, is gonna lie in this uh, in this plane. So when I, in the equator of the block sphere, I have the same fidelity with respect to the zero state, which is one half, and to the one state, okay? So you can analytically compute the decision boundary of your model, just performing this calculation and equating to one half. Okay, so for example, if I consider two layers of this data reloading model, I can find this kind of decision boundaries just uh, changing or shifting the, the trainable parameters. So these are for three different values of the trainable parameters. However, if I consider only a single layer of this model, notice that I'm changing the parameters, but I'm only able to perform a linear classification. So it's important that uh, to understand that no matter how much you train your model here, that you only you will be only be able to separate linearly. This is why adding more layers is important in order to be able to uh, increase the expressivity of your model. So if your model is not expressive enough, uh, you can be training your model for years and you will not be able to perform a good classification. So you need to ensure that your model is able to to reproduce uh, some kind of function. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pablo, so if okay. I can... <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so it was more than that, right? And in this case, it doesn't even depend on x two, right? It's, it uh, doesn't it, is, it does not depend on x one, right? Yeah. The the outcome. So it's yeah. really it's dependent only on x two, right? And linear on it. Yeah. Right. It's even worse, right? For sure. Right? Is yeah. there a reason for that? I mean, yeah, you can you, uh, take in. This is for a, a choice of the unitary. I chose the general unitary, and if you compute. Uh, the um, this decision boundary analytically, which is just this matrix perform matrix multiplication, you find that this uh, dependency of the on x uh, on x one vanishes at some point. So I, I did like the calculation. See, see. For example, for example, here uh, you could uh, add some um, quantum gates in between in order to not remove this, the not find remove this this uh, x1 parameter. OK, so you can avoid to have this very poor mm -hmm. model just I adding see, some see. gate. For example, you can add a Hadamard in between and, and avoid um, removing this parameter. Yeah. But, but it's sort of the same idea. It's, if not adding a full layer, it's, you have to add gates, right? That's the yeah. Thing. Yeah, and adding, exactly. adding a layer isn't a way adding more gates, right? So yeah, it's, it's, yeah. 
It's the same idea. Yeah, you have. Okay, okay. You, you, and you need to find this trade off because, because obviously, if you are adding layers, you are adding trainable parameters and you will have more chance to find some variant plateau during the training. So maybe you have a very expressive model, but you are not able to train it. So this, this can be somehow a problem to perform classification too. So yeah, but this is as in the classical case, this also happens there. Yeah, but this is the idea that, okay, the, you need to understand uh, what is able to do your model before uh, trying to train it, because maybe you will not be able to access good results because simply your model is not complex enough. And this is a, a good example, just using a single layer of this model. So, okay. And um, okay, for example, uh, this paper was it's from Maria Shu, which is actually a very important uh, person in, in quantum machine learning. And she is using here, for example, this data reloading technique and is showing how the kernel, the in three dimensions, how the kernel changes its shape depending on the number of layers that we are adding. So it's important to take into account that the number of layers is a very important uh, hyperparameter here. So we see that the best choice of the kernel is, is problem dependent. So uh, this is an, uh, and the class, uh, as in the classical case, a uh, kernel which is working very well to perform classification with some data, maybe is not very suitable for an, uh, another kind of classification. So one interesting work is this paper training quantum embedded kernels on near term quantum computers. And the idea is quite interesting. So they uh, take an ANSAT, a parameterized quantum circuit as an ANSAT, and this ANSAT is just taking an input point and constructing a future a future map somehow. So they compute the kernel using this uh, this uh, this ANSAT, and then they compute a quantity which is called um, the kernel target alignment. Okay, the kernel the kernel target alignment is computing me how much the the kernel is changing between two iterations. So okay, I have an ANSAT with with some trainable parameters. I compute the kernel, I compute the, the kernel target alignment, I compute the gradient of this kernel target alli alignment, and I uh, update the parameters uh, according to this uh, variation of the kernel target alignment. This, this way, what they want to do is, okay, when between two iterations, the kernel is not, uh, is not changing, uh, is the change of the kernel is below some threshold, uh, what we, you will have is a better classification. So we, we are considering that the kernel at some point can be is, is, is stabilized. Okay, so when the kernel is stabilized, this would be like the best kernel and you will have a better classification. For example, this is the idea. So when the kernel, the target, the kernel target alignment uh, increases during the training step, you go from a poor classification to a to an improved classification. Okay, so you train the future map until the variations in the kernel are reduced below a threshold that you set, and when you see that this kernel has stabilized, you consider that this is the best kernel for your problem. So this is a nice idea. Obviously, this needs a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of preprocessing. So okay, once we have seen like the we have presented the classical problem, the this super vector machine problem. We have seen where we can use the quantum computers. We have seen how to encode the data or some approaches to the encoding of the data and to some approaches to find the, the optimal the optimal kernel transformation. Uh, I need to uh, comment about this paper, which is uh, quantum machine learning beyond kernel method. Okay, in fact, when I prepared this workshop a month ago. Uh, I haven't read this paper, and luckily, this during this month, I saw this paper, which was published published this this year, and uh, which is quite relevant. In fact, it's published in Nature Communications, and the re the results are quite important and quite relevant and quite related with with this presentation. So, okay, they talk about these three methods to perform classification. The what they call uh, explicit models, which are just uh, parameterized quantum circuits, and then they perform some measurement, which can be also parameterized with, uh, with some uh, parameterized measurement, and uh, they you assign the class 
depending on the result of this measurement, then we have this uh, implicit method or kernel method, which that this is like the same circuit construction that I showed you some slides uh, ago. And here it appears this data reuploading approach. Okay, so we have these three kind of um, of approaches to perform classification. What they do is uh, they show how explicit, so kernel methods and implicit methods, which are parameterized quantum circuits, can be explained under the 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 framework of linear quantum linear models. Okay, so linear models in the Hilbert space. And they show they show how they are just the same somehow. And what they do is also they find a relation and a mapping from the data reuploading to explicit states, to, to ex this explicit approach. So they are explaining these three these three approaches under the same uh, framework. So roughly speaking, it's like saying that these three things are the same. Okay. However, there are some, some important results in this paper uh, regarding the representer theorem, which is a very important statement in, matching, in general machine learning, not only in quantum. Uh, this claims that implicit models can always achieve a, a smaller labeling error. So you will obtain better results for classification using kernel methods that parameterize uh, quantum circuits. However, what they claim is that this is due to the quantum kernel methods has a very high expressivity and uh, they can adapt uh, its shape uh, perfectly to the to the training uh, points however when you try to find a um, classification to some test point when you try to generalize your model you see that uh, the, the generalization uh, is quite poor because the model has learned the noise of the of the problem and you are not able to acquire good results with with your so good results with your test points uh, so uh, this is what they claim that no, normally you only focus on the accuracy of the model but you need to take into account the the generalization power of your model and they claim that the kernel methods has a very poor generalization power they unify the, the these three models. They show how data reloading can be considered an explicit uh, model for uh, machine learning, and they show in a specific in a specific problem, which is uh, classifying parity function, which is a toy model. But they show how explicit models can show exponential uh, learning advantage in the number of data samples with respect to the quantum kernel methods. So kernel methods needs exponential number of training points when this uh, parameterized quantum circuit needs linear number of, of training points, which is when you are dealing with big data, this is a very important difference. This is shown, this is shown in, this, in this figure, uh, which actually notice, I, I just want to comment that if you notice the, the classical, which is the blue line, uh, is uh, outperformed by, the, by this uh, explicit uh, model, which is this parameterized quantum circuit, and the key point here is just yes, see the implicit model the, the kernel methods has a very low square error when you are training because this is uh, this has a very high expressivity and adapts very well to the to the training points and to the to the defects of, of your points however when it's about generalize and when it's about uh, perform classification in your training set the this error uh, in, increases a lot so this shows how the 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 generalization uh, power of these models is quite poor and in fact this also shown that you can find some quantum advantage in classification with respect to the to the classical counterparts uh, as i show you in, in in previously in other papers with toy models it has been shown that you can find a, a quantum advantage uh, with respect to the classical counterparts and in this example you can obtain better results using these quantum approaches. However, I want to remark this about this uh, generalization. So, okay, I want to highlight uh, uh, some takeaway messages. Obviously, it's impossible to, to follow all, in, a, in, a, in one presentation, to follow all, all the concepts and to, to understand everything about all the papers, but 
the key ideas are that there are evidences of quantum learning advantage for artificial problems. And I emphasize artificial problems that are specifically uh, created to obtain, to find this advantage. Uh, we need classically hard to estimate kernels. We need to uh, design kernels which are not efficiently compute in a classical computer, because if not, you only need to perform classical machine learning. And uh, I also want to, to highlight that data reloading is a very powerful tool for quantum machine learning. In fact, uh, since its publication in this paper in 2020, uh, the most relevant papers in, in this field uh, uses use this, this approach for, for the encoding. So this means that actually this is quite powerful. And um, this last paper, which is from this year, is also comparing the models with this data reloading approach. So uh, it is essential uh, to consider the generalization capability, not only the, 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 the error in the classification. We need models that are, are able to generalize to, to new data, data, not only to the training data. And finally, it has yet uh, to be demonstrated uh, that the quantum models can provide advantages in solving real world problems, not only well-designed problems to show advantage, uh, it's uh, still under, uh, we, we need to find if it's possible in real world problems to find some quantum advantage. I don't know when, but for now, this is not, uh, this is not close. So yeah, this is all, uh, thank you so much. That. Yeah. Uh, that's the million dollar question, like quite literally, yeah. right? That's the yeah. maybe a billion dollar question, right? But yeah, true, I mean, that's what Kuku is doing and so many others, right? Yeah, sorry, I yeah, interrupted you. Go on. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. This is at the end. This is this gives uh, for a lot of discussion. The, that uh, so far, this is what we have. We have these uh, very important papers showing some advantage, but with problems that are designed to show advantage. So it's possible to to have a problem and to construct a model to have advantage in this problem, or we will always need to to construct the problem from the advantage. No, this is the we, we need to see if at some point the, the arrow will not be only in one side and we will be able to, to reverse the, the direction of the, of the theories in the quantum machine learning. But for now, we are still dealing to, to with, with, with these toy models, which are actually not useful in the, in, the real, in the real cases and the real scenarios. So yeah, and yeah, if you want to comment something, or you want to discuss discuss something, questions or comments uh, are always welcome. And yeah, thank you so much for your attention. And we can discuss whenever you want. And yeah, that's all.